and thanks for clicking in. This is the Uproar Live YouTube channel and we are so glad that you are here today. But before we get into this amazing message, go ahead and click that subscribe button. We have new videos for you every single week. We also have so many ways that you can connect with us. Go ahead and visit our description to learn more about it. And you can also sow into our ministry by using one of our six ways to give. Here at Uproar, we make giving easy. Mm -hmm. And your giving goes towards our many outreaches that we conduct all year long. So we want to thank you for partnering with us. Now, let's check it out. Over the last few years, I've, I've seen more and more churches going viral. I don't know if you pay attention, but, you know, I've seen more and more churches and pastors going viral. And, you know, if I, if I have to be honest, you know, I really never said nothing about it, but I'm starting to see more and more that it's getting out of control. I mean, churches with Easter, with Resurrection Sunday, even with Christmas, it's, it's becoming less and less about Jesus. And it's almost like I want to go viral by any means necessary, even if it means canceling out Jesus. I mean, I've seen crazy stuff. I, I, I've seen churches disrespect the word. I saw a church kick a Bible through a football post. <laughs> I've seen pastors do things that completely dishonor the word. And I grew up with the nation of Islam. So when my boxing trainers and stuff like that would drop a Quran, we would literally have to have a funeral service for it. They would wrap it. They would bury it. They would stand over it and pray. And I can't help but to think that some of these other religions and even the lost are laughing at how we can just, you know, without thought, just disrespect God's word. I've seen churches disrespect the blood and the resurrection recently. One church had actually told their staff members, if you mention the blood or talk about the blood or the resurrection, we will sit you down on Easter Sunday. Because we're not trying to spook out new people with words like pleading the blood over you. And they talked lightly about it. But last I checked, everybody's coming because of the blood and the resurrection. I've seen churches disrespect church. I've seen churches disrespect communion. I was on a Zoom with some older pastors on Friday, and we were bouncing ideas off and going over things for Resurrection Sunday, and one of the older pastors made a statement. He said, you know what I hate about the younger generation? They're, they're so into creating a power-packed experience, so they call it, that there's no room on their agenda to even have communion. And he said, I'm scared of a church that on resurrection, resurrection Weekend is so busy with stuff that they can't even have communion. And we're getting further and further away from the things of God. I heard a pastor make a whole room laugh at women that had experienced getting abortions. Not realizing that though you're making joke of, joke of it, I pastor and have counseled women that have done that 20 years ago, and they still live with the grief and the torment and the regret of making that decision. And just for the sake of going viral, you want to make a whole room laugh at them? But it's all about going viral, going viral. And ultimately, what we are doing is we are canceling out the Jesus in Resurrection Sunday. It is getting less and less about him to the point where some are having productions that don't even point at him. It's all about getting people in the building and going viral because you know what they say, bad publicity is better than no publicity. And less and less Jesus is being mentioned. And it makes sense because you cannot be intentional about going viral and also talk about Jesus because we serve a Jesus who never tried to go viral. He was almost anti-viral. <laughs> he would tell his disciples things like, hey, man, if you're going to give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. 
He would say, like, if you're going to fast, don't make a funny face and let people know you're hungry. He would say, if you're going to pray, don't get up there like them old school deacons and use big words and start repeating and stuttering just to impress people. No, 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 no. Keep it short and simple. Because your father with sees in secret will reward you openly. Jesus would teach, don't go viral. Don't try to go viral. But here's the thing. Whenever he tried to not go viral, he went more viral. I mean, Jesus was so anti-viral. Every time he tried to heal somebody, you know what he said to him? Don't tell nobody. If it was our generation, somebody would say, hey, hey, Joe, man, hold this phone while I touch this guy's eyes real quick. I want to let this thing get on the Internet. Or if we had a girl with the issue of blood, you know, oh, man, hashtag this, girl with issue healed, and post it up real quick. I guarantee you it'll get me a bunch of likes. We want everything to go viral, but we have and serve a God that always did things and said, don't tell nobody, don't tell nobody, don't tell nobody, don't tell nobody. But the more he did good, the more viral he went. And it shows me that it's not that God is against going viral. He's just against going viral when it's for our own glory. Because it comes down to motives. And I get why God is getting less and less mentioned in resurrection services, in services in general. Because there's no way you can talk about a God that practiced humility and come across so proud on social media. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. For three and a half years, Look at somebody say, we're going somewhere. It's going to be a little rabbit trail for a minute, but I promise before we leave, there will be many a tear shed. For three and a half years, all Jesus did was good things. He never did anything wrong. He was straightforward with some people. You know, he pushed a few people away because Jesus was the type of person that he loved you enough to tell you the truth. Even if, like the rich young man, you walked away, there were some people that disagreed with him. But he, he never did nothing to hurt nobody. He always went out of his way to be a blessing to everybody that needed him wherever he went. When people would follow him hungry, he would take the time to feed 20,000 plus people one time in the wilderness. And side note, you know you're a bad preacher when people will follow you into the wilderness and forget about evil. I hear people's alarms going off around 1230 sometimes because it's lunchtime and you have reservations. They love Jesus' preaching so much they followed him into the wilderness and were ready to faint and die because they forgot to eat because they wanted the word that bad. That's all he did was good. He stayed quiet and he taught everybody around him the importance of of just doing good without recognition. And check this out. Jesus was so low-key that in the Garden of Gethsemane, they didn't know who he was. How are you the baddest preacher of your day? Because like I said, you, you know you're bad when people are coming into a wilderness 20,000 deep to hear you preach with no microphone, no worship team, no child care, no parking lot ministry, no greeters, and people are following you into a wilderness just to hear you talk about your relationship with your daddy. And nobody knew who he was. He was so low-key, they needed Judas to kiss him to identify him. Because Jesus was so low-key, people really didn't know who he was. He was a mystery in a lot of ways. And the ones that knew him were the ones closest to him. Peter, James, John, Thomas, and, of course, Judas. And for three and a half years, these men and the women who would follow him, the Marthas and the Marys, they, they would give up everything to follow Jesus. 
They would give up businesses to follow Jesus. They would walk away from family to follow Jesus. You, you see Peter mention his mother-in-law once when Jesus healed her. You never hear Peter's family ever mentioned because their families even became sacrificial to give up dads and give up moms for the sake of the mission. They had invested their lives into following Jesus and Jesus taught them, even when they would ask about becoming great one day, he said, don't get so caught up in greatness. If you become a servant of all, greatness will follow you. He taught them, don't get in this for self-glory. Don't get in this to make a name for yourself. Do not get in this to go viral because it's not about your glory. It's about my father's glory. And it would be in the garden that his whole world would change. It would be in the garden that his disciples' whole worlds would change. And side note, I believe it was in the garden where the victory of the cross was really won. Because it was in the garden where Jesus made up his mind. The battle is won in your mind before it's won in your reality. Making up in your mind that you will not quit starts way before the battle actually comes. You can't wait to the battle and say, well, I'm not going to quit. No, 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 no. Not quitting is determined before the battle ever finds you. Not quitting is determined before the cancer ever finds you. Not quitting is determined before the arguments ever start. Not quitting is determined before the child comes home telling you something that doesn't make you happy. Before the teachers call you telling you something that doesn't make you happy. Not quitting is a decision that is made in the beginning if you don't make up the decision in the beginning you're going to walk away when they start beating you you're going to walk away when they start spitting on you you're going to walk away when your friends turn their backs on you you're going to walk away when they disrespect you and make you question your own identity you're going to walk away when they put a cross on your shoulder you're going to walk away when they hang you high and stretch you wide I want to know today how many have made up in their mind that I'm not a quitter. Whatever God calls me to do, I'm going to finish it. Whatever God calls me to do, I'm going to see it through. I'm going to love to the end. I'm going to protect to the end. I'm going to stay loyal to the end. I'm not going to turn my back to the end. I'm not going to back down to the end because if God put me in it, then I am going to see it through. Look at somebody and say, be a finisher. And Jesus made up his mind in the garden. When he wrestled with his father and said, I really don't want to go through with this. I don't like the idea of people putting their hands on me. I don't like the idea of people talking about me and spitting on me and, and challenging my identity. I don't like the idea that if, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will. See, God loves when we share our hearts with him. But at the end of the day, the only thing he's concerned about is, does his will win with you? Let me, pair, let me bring it down to reality a little bit. Lord, I really pray he's the one. I really pray she's the one. I really pray this is the job. I really pray this is the doctor. But Lord, it's not my will. It's your will be done. And when Jesus made up in his mind that it was the Father's will and not his, that's where the victory in the bad season happened. And ultimately, that was the setup for his resurrection. You are one thought away from your resurrection. But it would be in this moment that everything would turn. He has gone from hugging people and loving people and blessing the children and healing the sick and raising the dead to now he is being snatched and his life is out of his control. He has gone now to judgment. And they have put him before the people after putting their hands on him already after challenging his identity, after spitting on him, after ripping out his beard, they have put him before the people 
And they have told the people to choose between him and a murderer. And of course, the people chose the murderer over Jesus. Pilate gave them a chance to let their king free, but they said, he is not our king. They were questioning and challenging his identity. And every day we get out of bed, that's our lives. Because there will always be something challenging Christ's place in your life. And every time you make the wrong decision, the Bible says in Galatians, we crucify him afresh. But they would take him before judgment. They would tie him to the bema and whip him with the cat of nine tails. 39 lashes. Each lash ripping skin off his back. Yeah, it's not attractive. And I get probably why churches don't like to talk about it no more, but there are some things that need to be talked about. Because if you don't understand this, then you'll never appreciate what he did for you. So they whipped him. They beat him so bad, Isaiah said, that you could not even recognize him. And that's not where it stops. With his lungs collapsing, they put the wood on his shoulder. It is a shadow of Isaac. It is the fulfillment of the shadow of Isaac and Abraham walking up the mountain with the knife in the wood. He would get down the Via Della Rosa to the mountain of Calvary or Golgotha, and they would hang him high and stretch him wide. And then they would close the tomb on his dead body. Everybody that followed him didn't know what to do next. The Bible says the men backslid. Thomas doubted that he resurrected even when he did. Peter went back to fishing. They, they went back to what they knew before Jesus. And here's the thing. Whenever you backslide, you will always run back to the thing that Christ found you in. They all backslid because they didn't know what to do. They gave up so much, three and a half years to follow this man. And now he's gone. And it was bad when they snatched him out of the garden. But now bad has gotten horrible. Have you ever been at a place where bad got horrible? I mean, it was bad. But bad got horrible. Like watching somebody go from sickness to hospice. It was bad. But now bad has gotten horrible. Like the arguing when it started, you didn't see the arguing leading to divorce. Bad got terrible. It started with just one night staying out. You never saw one night staying out leading to your little girl getting pregnant. With bad gets horrible. I wonder today how many people even recently have seen bad get horrible. And that's what happened on Good Friday. And isn't it crazy how one of the most horrific events, if not the most horrific events in human history, the crucifixion of God Almighty, that we call it Good Friday. The Savior going through all that I just laid out and the picture I just painted, and we call that Good Friday. I would think it would be called Horrible Friday or Red Friday or Trauma Friday. Friday. I mean, anything other than good Friday. But thousands of years later, we call it good because it makes sense. Thousands of years later, we call it good because of what it did for all of us. And it lets me know that some of my most traumatizing seasons and some of your most traumatizing 
Seasons. Seasons where you wanted to die. Seasons where you wanted to give up. Seasons where you wanted to commit suicide. Seasons where you didn't want to live. Seasons where you didn't want to get out of bed. Seasons where you didn't feel like loving anybody. Seasons where you didn't even think that you were lovable. Seasons where things were being lost. Seasons where people were leaving you. Seasons where sickness was in your body. Seasons where all of your strength was gone. Seasons when you couldn't cry anymore. Seasons when the doctors had no answers. Seasons where you couldn't sleep at night. Seasons where your mind was running wild. Seasons where you couldn't function on the job. Seasons where you couldn't get out of bed to go to the job. Seasons where you went to get a shower and it turned into a two-hour cry session. Seasons where life was going from bad to worse. Isn't it crazy that if you give it some time, that which was once traumatizing, that which was once bloody, that which was once dead can actually become something good. Oh, wait a minute, Paul. It is he that worketh all things together for our good. David said it was good that he afflicted me. Guess what? If God steps into your life, don't be surprised if your bad season becomes your good Friday one day. If your bad season becomes the thing that makes sense, the thing that helps people, the thing that brings deliverance to people, the thing that gives people hope, the thing that makes people keep pressing. Say it was good. It was good Friday that they would close the tomb and all hope was stripped and nobody knew what to do. And then there was Saturday that doesn't get talked about. And Saturday is that, that day in between Friday and Sunday, the day where his cold body laid in the tomb all alone. Kind of like a cold body sitting in a morgue. A cold body sitting in a freezer, waiting to be identified. His cold body is in this tomb. And they think it's decaying. Saturday is the day in between your moment when things goes wrong, goes wrong in your resurrection. It's that weird time frame where you feel stuck. Like you know resurrection is coming soon and you know the pain from yesterday is supposed to do something for your future, but you're just stuck in the middle. I wonder if anybody in here has ever felt stuck like me before in different seasons. Stuck in the middle of a promise. Stuck in the middle of a process. Stuck in the middle of a prophecy. It's the day where things are just not moving. It's the day of grief and sorrow and people reflecting on yesterday. But Sunday would change everything. I'm so grateful for the women in the Bible. <laughs> because when Jesus was in the tomb, the boys had dipped. They were gone. Peter, who cut a man's ear off, was gone. James, his brother, was gone. Thomas, gone. Nathan, gone. Nathaniel, gone. All of his boys were gone. And I shared this a few weeks ago, how it shouldn't surprise you as you get closer to your circle, how small your circle becomes. Or as you get closer to your dream, how small your circle becomes becomes. There's a reason the pyramids in Egypt are still standing. It's because they are not bottom light and top heavy. They are bottom heavy and top light. The closer you get to your purpose, God establishes your longevity 
by the amount of people that fall off around you. There's a reason the boosters fall off when the rocket makes it into space. That which was needed to get you there is not needed once you arrive. And Jesus is sitting in this tomb alone. And you would think it would be the men that would show up and say, I got your back, dog. No. It was Mary Magdalene and Mary that came to see Jesus. Mary, his mother, and that one woman he found that had some issues. Most believe she was the woman that was caught in adultery that Jesus found. It says that they came down to the tomb to, to see. I don't want to breeze over this. They came to see something. It was Resurrection Sunday, and they came to see something. They came to see the tomb, but they came with expectation to see something. See, I've learned about God. There is so much power when a person comes with expectation. You can't get nothing out of God if you don't come hungry and you don't come thirsty. But when you come with expectation, expectation that something is going to happen, it says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. When they came with expectation, and, and they weren't coming to see a living Jesus, they were coming to see a dead Jesus, but they were coming with expectation. And whenever God sees somebody that's coming with expectation, don't be surprised if he starts shaking things up. Don't be surprised if he starts moving things around. Don't be surprised if he starts shaking up that problem in your life, shaking up that dilemma in your life, shaking up that disease in your life. See, God has a way of shaking things up when somebody comes with expectation. I wonder this Resurrection Sunday, is there about a hundred people here that have some crazy expectation, expectation that God God is getting ready to shift things. Expectation that God is getting ready to shift your marriage, shift your children, shift your sickness, shift your finances. Look at somebody say, he's shaking some stuff up. I can feel it in my mind. I can feel it in my body. I can feel it in my spirit. Something is happening in my life. It says that God shook the whole thing up. Because they came with expectation to see the tomb where the cold, dead body of Jesus was supposed to be. And I like how Mark says, Mark says they came down with spices. And I used to wonder why would they come down to make things smell good. And then it hit me. Mary the mother and Mary Magdalene, they were coming down with spices because they did not want the stench of their leader to be smelt by the world. See, there are some people that like to make the stench get stronger. And there are others that come with spices when people hit a bad season. Last I checked, there was only one accuser of the brethren. And that is Satan. And I challenge you, next time somebody brings some stench to you about somebody, next time somebody brings some gossip to you about somebody, you might as well just go ahead and call them what they already are and say, get away from me, devil. Because to have the heart of God means that I am not trying to add to the stench. My job is to protect the stench because after all, for the last three and a half years, we've been building this with Jesus. And they come down to the tomb trying to do a good thing. And as they come down to the tomb, an angel has appeared. The same angel that called the earthquake has appeared. And it says he rolls away the door. Now, I'm about to bring this home. But this door represents every door in your life that seems impossible to move. Everybody in here has a door. 
Because that's how you get to the next level is through a door. And there is often a door that seems like it can't move. Whether it's with your finances, whether it's with your family, whether it's with your future, you name it, whether it's with your faith, there is often a door that feels and seems like no matter what happens, this thing can't move. But what I love about the story is God is letting us know on Resurrection Sunday that there is no door. I don't care how heavy it is. I don't care how impossible it looks. I don't care how big it is. There is no door that God cannot open in your life. If God put the door in front of you, then God wants to open the door for you. The only thing that's holding it back is your expectation. He doesn't even need you to believe that he's able. He just needs you to come with expectation. He'll show you that he's able. It says that he opened the door. What is the door you need open today? What is the door that you've been praying for? What is the door that you've been fasting for? What is the door that you've been worshiping for? What is the door that has you in church on Resurrection Sunday? Because if you don't have a door, then you don't have no hope. If you don't have a door, then you don't have desire. And if you don't have desire, desire, then God can't give you whatsoever things you desire. What is your door and do you have the kind of faith that says, God, I believe that you can open it. God, I believe that you can sit on it. God, I believe that nothing is impossible for you. God, I believe that you're able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that I may ask or think. God, I believe that if I ask for anything in your name, you are able to do it. Do you still believe? Touch three people and say, it's going to open. It's going to open. It's going to open. It's going to open. And it says that he not only opened the problem, opened the door, but he sat on it. And it's so bad to me because it lets me know that whatever is frustrating me, if I give it over to God, he can just chill on it. This is God showing off. The angel didn't have to sit on the door. It was God showing off. And I don't know if you realize this, but God wants to show off in your life. He doesn't put candles under a bed. He wants to show off. Is God able to show off in your life? So the angel's just sitting there. And raiment, white as the snow. And, and here's the part I laughed at. It says the keepers, the keepers. Pilate did this. He put keepers and he gave them charge. He said, whatever you do, seal it and do not let this thing open. Do you know there are some keepers, or you may want to call them haters, that are assigned to your life to keep you from opening up a door or walking through a door that God has for you. But before it's all said and done, God wants to show you that I am going to cause your haters, cause your keepers to be shaken up. I am going to cause your haters, cause your, sh your keepers to have have a moment where they see that my hand has been on your life. It says, for fear of him, the keepers did shake, and they became as. Look at how Jesus raising caused a transform, a transformation. He was alive. His enemies became as dead. The only dead people at the tomb were the haters. Maybe you should text your haters right now and say, keep on hating. <laughs> and the angel came to these women and said, I know you seek Jesus. I know you seek Jesus because when others ran, you stayed put. I know you seek Jesus because when others got afraid, you said, I don't care. I know you love Jesus because when others said, I'm going backwards, you said, even though Jesus may be dead, it's with Jesus I got to move forward. I know you seek Jesus. I wonder when's the last time God looked at our lives and said, I know you seek me. You seek me because of how you pray. 
You seek me because of how you read. You seek me because of how you give. I know you seek me. He said, I know you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He's not here. He's not here. See, you can't say you're looking for Jesus and keep going to look in dead places for him. He's not here. Okay, let me, let me break it down a little bit. You say you're looking for Jesus, but you keep going back to that guy. He's not here. You keep going back to that woman. He's not here. You keep going back to that struggle. He's not here. You keep going back to your friend from high school, even though they've never grown up. He's not here. How long are you going to keep expecting to find Jesus while you keep going back to your tombs? He's not here. He is risen. You want to know where God is in your life? Look for everything in your life that has resurrection to it. If it does not have resurrection tied to it, Jesus is not there. Look, let, let me show you the place. Come on. Let me take you on a journey real quick. Look at the place where he laid. It was right there. Now go quickly and tell the disciples. Look at how the angel takes us along with Mary to the exact place just to point at where Jesus was dead. And then says, go quickly. I don't know if you're like me, but when I drive, I cannot stare at the rearview mirror for long. If I stare at it for too long, everybody around me on the highway will be in danger. You cannot drive a destination and keep looking at the rearview mirror the whole time. There's a reason it's small and your windshield is big. Most of us are destroying the lives of everybody around us because we keep looking at something small instead of looking at something big. Your history is small. What you did wrong is small. Who you hurt is small. Who hurt you is small. Are you looking at the rear view mirror and trying to get to a big purpose? There's power in glancing at it. Because when I glance at it, I can remember, oh, yeah, I used to be hooked on that. When I glance at it, I can say, oh, yeah, I remember back in the day, I'd fall into that. When I glance at it, I can say, oh, yeah, if it hadn't been for Jesus. And when I glance at it, it makes me grateful for my salvation. Every now and then, you need to take a journey back to where God found you. This is what makes church people get puffed up and disconnected. They forget where God found them. I know church people that you can't tell anything to because they will crucify you. And they forget where God found them. I know you're 60, but you, you know, you used to drop it like it's hot. The only reason you don't now is because you won't be able to get it back up. But if we're not careful, look at somebody and say, there was a time. You don't sleep on my time. If we're not careful, we get disconnected from the world because we forget. We forget what it was like to feel the feeling of love and be lost. We forget the feeling of what it was like to go to school and be influenced. We forget what it feel, felt like to do wrong and know we were wrong, but we couldn't stop it. We forget about it, and when we forget about it, we become untouchable. And every now and then, you need to go back and just glance and reflect on how God found you. That's what kept me preaching all these years. I never forget where God found me. 
And when I fight the devil today, I don't fight the devil today with new weapons that I have based on where I am in life. No, 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 no. When I need to find that power, I go back to my home that I lived in up until I was 29 or so years old in Brooklyn Homes. I go back to Gretna Court where I used to live where the shootings took place not too long ago. I was living there almost 10 years ago. I go right back there and remember when I was preaching faith in a horrible situation. I go back there and think about when I was preaching faith and my car got repossessed right there and I had to ask somebody for a ride to Sunday morning church service. That's where I pull my strength from. And when I need real strength, I mean, that's strength I pull. But when I need real strength, I go back to my childhood. Oh, there's some strength I can pull from that. See, see, if you're not careful, you don't pull strength. You make yourself a victim. But those are the moments I pull from in my weakest because those are the moments that most people would have killed themselves or, or lost it at some point in their life. But I look at my life and I'm still standing. When's the last time you took a quick look at where God found you? He says, look, but quickly, quickly, what do I got to do quickly? Quickly tell his disciples. The reason you can't stare at it is because there are people in your world that are lost and waiting for you to talk about Jesus. And you'll never find the strength to talk about Jesus while you keep staring at your dead place. So glance, he says, but quickly go tell the disciples that he is risen. The God who said, tell nobody nothing for three and a half years is now telling them to tell somebody something. And what is he saying? He's saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the resurrection viral. It will start. It will start. See, I have problems. Sometimes I'll talk to preachers, and they'll say things like, it's really stupid and foolish, and they don't understand the Bible. But they'll say things like, you know, women ain't supposed to speak in church. But they're okay speaking to your kids in children ministry. They're, they're okay singing. What, what it, which is it? And really, the people that quote those scriptures are quoting them with a bad understanding. But this scripture lets me know that if it wasn't for a couple female preachers, the story of the resurrection would have died if God was depending on the men to spread it. See, this should get every lady excited because God is looking to meet you today. God is trying to put a word in you today. God is trying to get his story out through you, even though people may try to silence you. God is trying to get his story and his message out for you. He got the word out. Now, it would be the men that would carry it for thousands of years by preaching and starting churches and all. But, but, but don't sleep on the two women. That had they not been in position, the men never would have experienced resurrection. Most men in here will tell you they're only here experiencing resurrection because of some woman, because of some mom, because of some wife, because of some girlfriend, because of some grandma, because of some aunt that prayed for them and told them about Jesus. And they didn't have social media, but through their mouth, they made this message go viral. Tell, tell the men, tell the men, tell the men, tell the men that Jesus is risen, that Jesus is risen, that Jesus is risen. He is not dead. Behold, he goes before you. But you know what I love here? It says that as they were going to tell the men, Jesus met them. They're going to tell the men that Jesus is in Galilee. Now, I've been to Galilee. I've been to Jerusalem. I've been to where Jesus' tomb is. Galilee is about a two and a half hour drive from Jerusalem. Now, for two women to have to walk that would take forever. And it's not just walking that. They have to walk through the desert and the wilderness 
and the road of Jericho, which people would get robbed and beaten, stolen things from, you know, the Good Samaritan. That's that whole story of the man that went on the Jericho road. These two women have to go down in bad situations, in dangerous situations, which lets me know that sometimes God will call you to go into something that scares you to death, but just, just trust that if he sent you to it, he will keep anything from happening to you. And as they get started, Jesus met them. It lets me know this, that whenever somebody makes up in their mind to take the message viral, God will meet them. God will meet them. God will meet them. People may not like you, but God will meet you. People may not follow you, but God will meet you. I remember when I first started posting Christian stuff, I could post something like, you know, like, it's sunny outside, and smile, and I would get like 200 likes. When I got saved, I'd post a scripture, and I'd be lucky to get two. Same people following me, but they didn't like my content. But at the end of the day, those people are gone. And I'm only where I am in life today because at some point, God met me. And it comes down to this, how bad do you want God to meet you because a lot of those people that I see going viral off stupidity, talking about the blood in a negative way, talking about the word, talking about, you know, communion, talking about church, talking about this, talking about that, that God cares about. I can look at them and see they are the type of people that God has never met before. Because people that God has met, they're a rare breed. Because they've experienced so much loss along the way and pain along the way that once he found them, the only thing they wanted to tell people was not their story, but the story of the resurrection. And Jesus met them as they were going. This Resurrection Sunday... I want to close it with this. God is looking for somebody, it says, as they went to tell the disciples, as they went to tell the disciples. God is looking for somebody. Matter of fact, I'll let you preach it to three people. Just touch three people around you and say, get your as in order. It took a minute for somebody. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. As they went, Jesus met them. Because they were trying to take the message viral. And as they went, Jesus met them. And, and Jesus didn't say nothing grand to start. He just said, all hail. And this is where understanding the writers is important. Because if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'd be like, why are they all telling the same story? And why are they all kind of different? And there's a reason. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are like four lawyers. They're trying to present a different case to you about Jesus. See, John tries to tell us how Jesus is the Son of God. So the whole book of John is trying to prove to us that Jesus is God's Son. Now, Luke tries to show us that Jesus is the Son of Man. So Luke is just trying to show you Jesus the dude. The sleepy dude that will chew you out. He's just trying to show you Jesus is the son of man. Mark is trying to tell you that Jesus came to serve. And that's why most of the book of Mark is about Jesus serving. But Matthew has the job of pointing us to Jesus, the king. And that's why on the cross they will say, if you're the king of the Jews. That's why Pilate says, if he's your king. And everything Jesus does in the book of Matthew is to show us that he is king. 
So when he says, hell, these will be the first words Jesus says since resurrecting. Hell. All hell. But it's only two of us. All hell. He's not just speaking to the woman, to the women. He's speaking to the world. He's letting the world know that the king is not dead. The king is risen. The king is here. And he wants to show through your life to people that he is king. But he cannot show through your life that he is king if you're not taking this message viral. So this Resurrection Sunday, my question is this. When's the last time you told somebody outside of your home about Jesus? When's the last time you told a coworker something? And here's a real good test. When's the last time somebody cussed around you and apologized? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I, I know, I know you. I know your walk. I know your faith. And if this is not our way of life, because when they apologize, what I used to say when I was a construction worker, it's, it's no problem, man. But then I stopped saying that because I realized they're not apologizing to James. They're apologizing to the Christ in James. And I cannot stop them when God is convicting them. We are the lights of the world. God is placing you, and you want to have job security? You want to get promotion after promotion like Joseph and like Daniel? Be God's ambassador wherever you are. I promise you, they will not be able to let you go till God's done with you. Because God is looking for people that say, Lord, every day I get out of bed, I'm looking for a mission. Send somebody into my life. Your angry boss could be your assignment. That nagging coworker could be your assignment. And while you're talking about them in the break room, you're, you're losing your test for the next level. Because the only way they change is through you. If you're taking this message viral, when's the last time you told your children about the resurrection? When's the last time you brought up resurrection in your marriage? And this could be why God's not meeting us. Is he's waiting for somebody to take this thing viral. So as we prepare our hearts for communion, we have to take the responsibility to not be the first generation that stops taking this message viral when we have so much technology to work with. You realize we have technology they didn't have. Can you imagine if Paul had Twitter? <laughs> like them haters tried to stone me, but they didn't win. You know? But can you imagine if they had Twitter? Can you imagine if Jesus had Twitter? What would he be saying with time running out? Three and a half years before I take my last breath. What would he be saying about time running out? And what are you saying with time running out? We've got so much to work with, and we're using these platforms that they would have changed the world with. We're using these platforms to take Jesus even more out. And if we're not careful, we are going to be the first generation to allow a decline in Christianity. Not because he's not real. I've been there. I've stood by his tomb where he laid his body is not there. I've had an encounter with God myself time after time after time. But if we're not careful, we're going to be the generation that drops the ball. The generation that stops pointing people to the resurrection.